Um, I'm Mark Hanuel. I'm director of the Institute for the Humanities. So welcome to the Institute for the Humanities. Um, I also would like, um, because she hasn't gotten sufficient introduction at this point for everyone, Katie Corboy is shaking her head. Don't introduce me again. But Katie Corboy is our new um, assistant director at the Institute, for those of you who haven't met her yet. And she's doing a wonderful job getting us settled into this new space and assisting us in so many different ways. I would like to mention a few upcoming events. Gatry Reddy will be presenting the next fellow lecture here, February 16th at 4 p.m. So I hope that everyone will come to join us for that. Um, among our many other events coming up, Paisley Kurak will speak on transgender identity on February 9th at 5 p.m. via Zoom only. Katerina Scalvedi um, will present her work as a graduate resident scholar on February 13th, 2 p.m. here, and we will have that as a hybrid. Whoops. Yeah. Friday. Oh, it's this Friday? Yeah, why did I put that? Cave is coming. Okay. So um she, yeah, Katerina is on Friday, February 10th at um at noon. Okay, all right. Sorry about that. Friday, February 10th at noon here. Um bring your lunch, right? Bring your lunch. Um and it's a pre-circulated paper, so please ask us for the paper and we'll send it to you. Um, it is an amazing chapter. It's so good. And so I hope that all of you will join us for that. Um, and the link for the um, transgender talk is we can also make sure you get that. Um, so further out on the calendar, please note that on Monday, April 17th, I know I have that date right. We'll have an extraordinary series of events on indigenous futures featuring Eve Tuck, Lena Miari, and many other luminaries. So please be sure to put that on your event calendars. Um, this will be an all day thing and you'll see a program circulating shortly. We also will present um, a noontime panel on the work of poet Allen Ginsberg on April 18th, Tuesday. One of our colleagues, Steve Wine, um, who's director of the Center for Global Health, he has just written a book about Ginsburg's mental health and his poetry. And he's assembling a really great panel with Ginsburg experts to talk about um, that poet's life and work. This is just a tiny selection of what we have going on. So please check out our website, follow us religiously on social media and, um, and definitely feel free to ask me personally about any of these things. I am so pleased to introduce Rachel Goodman, a professor in the UIC Department of Philosophy um, for her talk today. She received her PhD from the University of Chicago and held positions at the University of Leeds and the University of Nebraska before joining us at UIC in 2018, although you joined the faculty officially in 2019. Is that how it went? I don't always mention the BA degrees, but in this case, it's really interesting and worth mentioning that she has a BA from the University of Sydney in philosophy and a BA in politics and English. I didn't know about that English in your background from the University of Western Australia. Um, so I love that. Professor Goodman's work intervenes in debates about the notion of singular thought. These debates focus on mental representation anterior to its mental instances in visual art, literature, or other material examples. Goodman navigates long polarized positions between descriptivists whose claim that we represent thoughts through categories and singularists who claim that we represent direct thoughts about objects. From what we've been hearing from her work thus far at the Institute this year, she seeks to affirm, but also revise singularism. She has been a major voice in the debates about mental representations and co-edited a recent volume for Oxford on singular thought and mental files. Mental files, um, which I am now getting to understand is a kind of middle way between the entrenched sides of the debate and one of the subjects of today's lecture have been at the center of Goodman's work 
and she has spoken widely on this and many other aspects of the philosophy of mind in prominent journals, including the Philosoph Philosophical Quarterly, Mind, and Noose. Among several new essays, a piece on shared thought and communication will appear in a forthcoming volume, also from Oxford, on sharing thoughts. She has also presented her work at invited lectures and symposia throughout the world. It's been a great pleasure to have her in the fellowship group this year, and I hope all of you will join me, join me in welcoming Professor Goodman to discuss her work, Mental Files and Singular Thought. Thank you. That was so nice. That sounds like uh, such an amazing distinguished person. <laughs> um, so um, I want to start by just saying a couple of thank yous. Um, firstly, I want to thank um, the other fellows in, in this year's fellowship group. Um, it's been just it's really great to have a chance to engage with their work and I really appreciated them engaging with mine it's it's really been terrific and then especially um, I want to thank um, the Institute and Mark Canuel um, who's put together all these um, many many excellent events throughout the year and and um, there's you know going to be lots lots more throughout the rest of the year um, so thank you okay um, so what I want to do um, today is hopefully um, is give a pretty a sort of general overview of some issues surrounding mental files and singular thought but before I kind of start introducing and explaining those notions um, I want to say a little something about the context in which they arise. Um, and that is the context of what sometimes gets called the theory of reference, in particular, the theory of mental reference. So very broadly speaking, theory of mental reference is part of a larger attempt to understand um, human mental representation. Um, so you might ask what kinds of facts? Are we interested in when we're interested in in understanding human mental representation um and here there is a kind of tradition in philosophy that has sort of sought to understand um human minds um in terms of what the inside of a mind looks like um in terms of ideas considered as sort of internal to a mind um but one thing that you might think is that our interest in representation isn't just going to be an interest in what the inside of a mind looks like it's also going to be an interest in how what goes on inside relates to the world around us so the thought is you could sort of understand as as much as you want about ideas or mental states just considered as entities inside the mind and unless you focused on reference and is the relation of mental states to the world around us, you won't have a good picture of representation. So that's a kind of thought that motivates an interest in reference and motivates the theory of reference. Okay, so next notice that the world around us, the world we interact with, the world we think about, um, contains not just qualities or properties, but also particular things, right? So things like, like chairs, tables, desks, other people, living things, it contains a lot of things that um, that possess properties and bear relations to one another and to us. So part of understanding mental representation, an important part you might think, is understanding our ability to think not just about qualities, not just about properties, but about particular things. Okay, so the theory of reference focuses often on, theory of mental reference focuses on thoughts about particular things often. Okay, so here are some questions we're going to ask about that. We're going to ask what kinds of abilities are involved in thinking about particular things, um, what's involved in singling them out, what's involved in learning about them, what's involved in having beliefs about them. Um, we're going to ask what does the sort of mind look like? What is it? What, how does it work such that we're in a position to think about the particular things in the world around us? Okay, so that's the very, very general context in which talk of mental files and the so-called mental files theory of singular thought comes up. So in that context, it's common to hear file theorists talk in something like the following way. So they'll say things like, um, think of 
a concept on um, a concept of a particular object as a mental file on that object. Okay, so when you first encounter the object, maybe by perceiving it or hearing about it, first time you think about it, you open a file and then you maintain that file. Um, you add information to the file, you subtract information, you update the information, but that information can change while the file itself, the concept, persists. Okay, so that's the way that mental file theorists talk. The first thing that I want to emphasize is something that I'll come back to throughout the talk, and that is that this kind of talk involves a metaphor. So we're supposed to understand something about how thoughts about particular things work by thinking of or picturing concepts of objects as files. Um, I'm sort of flagging that it's a metaphor because as you'll see, one of the things I wanna do is suggest that proper understanding of the theory requires us to be careful about what the metaphor is being used for. So um, it requires us to think carefully about how to interpret the metaphor properly as part of the theory. So with any metaphor, um, there's always gonna be a sort of question of what the relevant comparison is and what's being claimed, right? So nobody in this context is claiming that there are literal physical files inside our head. So the question is, you know, what, what are they claiming? What is the comparison meant to be? Okay, so to give you um, a, a, a sort of sense of the answer to that question, I'll start to give you a sense of the answer to that question, I'm going to give um, some quotes from early file theorists, and I'm going to say something about how they're using the metaphor and what theoretical role it's playing for them. But um, first, a quick aside. Um, so, you know, often when people talk about the mental files theory, they focus much more on more recent file theorists, some of whom I'll talk about a little bit later. And I think the sort of reason for that is because the, 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 the more recent theorists do give a kind of clearer and in fact less metaphorical um, account of the, the file picture. Um, I have been rereading um, early file theorists recently, um, in part because I'm writing a compass piece on files and I wanted to sort of give a uh, um, a kind of picture of how the use of filing has kind of um, developed in the philosophical literature. But what that's sort of confirmed, what that sort of made me realize is that um, I think that early file theorists present something closer to what I'd sort of independently come to think of as a better version of the theory. The way they talk is more in line with a better version of the theory. And one way to think about that is that the metaphor of mental references involving mental filing gets like a little bit distorted in the literature as time goes by. So I'm gonna come back to that. Okay, but now here's Strawson. Strawson's sometimes called the first mental files theorist. He's not actually the very first person to use the language of mental files. Grice and Lockwood use it just like a smidgen earlier, but he does a little more with it. Okay, so the quote from Strawson's from a 1974 book and the context is that Strawson's worried about a, a particular version of a sort of well-known philosophical problem known as Frege's puzzle. Um, I'm gonna avoid talking about canonical formulations of Frege's puzzle, um, but for our purposes, what he's sort of worried about here is roughly, um, he's worried about what it is we learn about the world when we learn an identity fact that we didn't previously know. So by an identity fact, um, we mean, he means something, a fact like the fact that George Eliot is Marianne Evans, is identical to Marianne Evans. Okay, so relative to certain assumptions about what mental representation consists in, learning a fact like that, a fact, the identity fact, like the fact that, that George Eliot is Marianne Evans, can sort of look puzzling because all you're learning is that an identical an object's identical to itself and you know surely we all already knew that all objects are identical to themselves um, but you, you can learn identity facts right you could be easily in a situation where you previously had some knowledge that was about George Eliot maybe you know that she was the author of Middlemarch and you also have 
sets of beliefs or knowledge that are about Marianne Evans. Maybe you know that she's a person in your family tree who was born in 18, um, 18 and, um, and died in, in uh, uh, several years later. <laughs> um, um, and then in that situation, you could very easily learn that George Eliot, author of Middlemarch, is identical to Marianne Evans, my great great aunt who was born in 1818. You get the idea. Okay. And so, what does Strawson want? He wants a kind of general account of what kind of learning goes on and what's going on cognitively or psychologically in this kind of situation. Okay, so here's the quote. Um, he says, it will help to have a model or a picture. Imagine a man as in part a machine for receiving and storing knowledge of all the items of which he already has some identifying knowledge. The machine contains cards, one card for each cluster of identifying knowledge in his possession. On receipt of an ordinary predication invoking one such cluster, the appropriate card is withdrawn, the new information is entered on it, and the card is returned to stock. On receipt of an ordinary relational predication involving two such clusters, the two appropriate cards are withdrawn, cross-referring entries are made on both, and both cards are returned to stock. On receipt of an identity statement invoking two such clusters, the two appropriate cards are withdrawn and a new card is prepared bearing both names of which one heads one of the original cards and one the other and incorporating the sum of information contained in the original cards. The single new card is returned to stock and the original cards are thrown away. In this last case, the total number of entries in the machine stock isn't increased, it's diminished by the elimination of what turn out to be duplicate entries. Okay, so to give a, um, a general account of what it looks like to learn an identity, Strawson says we should picture the mind as employing a system of file cards. Okay, um, so what he thinks is that when we think about learning new information about objects, we tend to focus on the case that he calls ordinary predication, right? So that's the case where you acquire a belief that a certain object, say Marianne Evans, has a certain property, say property of having died many years ago. Okay, so in that kind of case, um, learning Marianne Evans died many years ago involves adding information to your file. All right, so in this kind of case, the file-based view doesn't look all that different from a view on which um, adding a belief is a bit like adding a sentence to a list. It doesn't look all that different. But there are other kinds of learning as well. Um, so for example, you could learn a relational fact. So example, the fact that George Eliot, author of Middlemarch, lived with George Liu, author of The Problems of Life and Mind. And in that case, the file picture says you have to add information to two slides, to two um, files, and then cross-reference the entries. Okay. Now, learning an identity fact, like the fact that Marianne Evans is identical to, to George Eliot, can look puzzling because there's no additive process that takes place here, right? I already had all the predicative information that I end up having once I know that George Eliot is, um, is Marianne Evans. Um, and I already knew everything's identical with itself. Um, so the file theory says that what happens in this kind of case isn't a sort of additive, um, it's not addition of information in the way that we might ordinarily think about it. Um, instead, it's a kind of consolidation right? So what you do is you merge your two files, um, you create a new one, you label it with both names, and you put all the information from the old one on the new file. Okay, so there's a sort of sense in which less is represented um, after you gain the new knowledge, less is explicitly represented. Okay, so the thought is, if you picture having beliefs and forming new beliefs in terms of possession of a kind of list of sentences, that state just that this or that object has this or that property or stands in this or that relation, then this kind of case of learning an identity is gonna seem puzzling, it can seem puzzling. But if instead you picture 
it in terms of having an updating a filing system, you can accommodate the kinds of change to one's ordinary belief state that happen when you learn this kind of thing. Okay. So what's the, the moral overall? Well, it's something like gaining new information or gaining new beliefs, changing your outlook on the world. It does involve a change in your belief state, you know, to be sure, but picture this not as adding a new sentence stating a fact about an object bearing a property or a relation to a list. Think of it instead as updating a filing system, you know, with the aim that you bring the filing system into better line with, make it reflect better which objects there are in the world, which properties they have, what relations they bear to one another, and so forth. Okay. All right, so that's Strawson. Um, next, here's a slightly later quote from Kent Bach. So Bach's writing in 1987, but I'm also grouping him with the kind of early file theorists. And Bach's talking about a slightly different question to Strawson, but he's still interested in the nature and the role of identity beliefs. Um, however, he's interested in how identity beliefs allow other beliefs to be, in his terms, inferentially integrated. Okay, so um, Bach says, however, despite the fact that one could be ignorant or even mistaken about the identity of the object of the belief, identity beliefs are still important, for they enable these beliefs to be integrated with other beliefs inferentially. For example, I believe of Dick Holloway, that he was Dick Holloway, um, that he was my boyhood chum who lived three doors down the block, that he was in my third or fourth grade class, and that he said that the largest number is infinity 12. Couldn't forget that. Um, um, I believe them all of the same individual, but without the appropriate identity beliefs, I would fail to realize that. So those italics are mine. Now, it might be objected that considering all the combinations of pairs of things I believe of Dick Holloway, to ascribe the required number of identity beliefs is psychologically implausible. This would be so if they were all individually represented, but I don't mean to suggest that. Rather, these identity beliefs are jointly constituted by the fact that all the beliefs in question are stored in one file. And then he goes on to say he's going to develop that idea for a bunch of purposes. Okay, so what's going on with Bach is we're being introduced to mental files as a kind of solution to a problem. Um, so the problem is you might have a bunch of beliefs. They might all happen to be about one particular individual, but you can easily imagine a situation in which the person who has these beliefs doesn't realize that they're all about the same thing, right? So in that, the, the, the representation on the slide, you know, it might be the fact that, um, it might in fact be the case that A is again to B and to C and to D and so forth, but the person who has that list of belief, that list of beliefs might not realize that. So philosophers will sometimes put this by saying that the co-reference of the beliefs isn't manifest or evident to them. So Bach's first point is that identity beliefs, like the belief that, you know, Dick Holliday, Holloway, the kid in my third grade class, is identical to Dick Holloway, the, larger, the kid who thought the largest number was infinity 12. Those kinds of beliefs play the role of in inferentially integrating all these otherwise isolated beliefs. So one way to see what that means, this, this idea about inferential integration, is to think about um, what allows a thinker to make the kinds of just very ordinary inferences that, that she often makes. Okay, so imagine that I believe these last, you have these last two beliefs, right? Um, I believe, as it happens with Dick Holloway, that he was in my third grade class. And I also believe as it happens with Dick Holloway that he, he said that the, the largest number is infinity 12. Now, it's only if it's evident to me that those two beliefs are about the same thing that I'm in a position to rationally draw the conclusion 
that a kid in my third grade class said the largest number is infinity 12. Okay, so another way to put this is that um, I couldn't draw the conclusion unless I also possessed the belief that Dick Holloway is Dick Holloway or D is identical to E. Okay, the identity belief plays the role of kind of inferentially integrating the other two beliefs and sort of makes it the case that they can get together and be part of an inference with one another. Okay, so um, notice that this phenomenon of inferential integration doesn't, I mean, it doesn't only, it's not only something that we use for um, theoretical inferences, and it's not only something that applies to beliefs, it also applies to, um, to uh, you know, suppositions, desires, um, thoughts, other kinds of representational mental states. So, for example, just imagine that I've got a desire to see Venus, and also I've got a belief that Hesperus is the, the first star visible in the evening. In that situation, I'm not in a position to kind of rationally go out and bring it about that my desire gets satisfied. But if I believe that Venus is identical to Hesperus, I'm in a position to do that, right? Just go outside in the early evening and look up at the night sky and satisfy my desire. Okay, so another example, um, think about how you might even try to go about constructing a narrative or telling a coherent story if you didn't have any identity beliefs about the characters as they appear throughout the narrative, right? That would go very badly. Um, okay. All right, so Bach's first point is that identity beliefs inferentially integrate um, beliefs and other mental states. Okay. Next, um, he's noticing a worry about this and he's introducing mental files as a solution. So the worry is that we wouldn't want to say, he says, that for any two beliefs about the same thing, those beliefs being inferentially integrated requires a third belief, um, you know, the belief that, that A is identical to B, A is identical to C, and so on and so forth, as I've represented here. And he says we wouldn't want to say that because it would be psychologically implausible considering how many other beliefs you'd have to have. Okay, so the thought is instead of a very long list of additional beliefs, he suggests that the kind of inferential integration of a cluster of beliefs is achieved in virtue of a kind of storage fact, a kind of organizational fact, right? All the integration beliefs are contained in the same file. Okay, so we've got what we've got here is a proposal about how minds organize information whereby co-filing being in the same file is a way of encoding without explicitly representing the fact that a bunch of beliefs are actually beliefs about the same thing. Okay, so there's no explicit representation of the identity information on the right. It's represented just by the fact that all the predicates are contained in the same file. Okay, so before I move on, um, I um, am going to mention a couple of things, maybe just for the philosophers, maybe not just for the philosophers, I don't know. Um, but I sort of, um, uh, okay, I can't help but say um, the following. <laughs> um, so um, you might kind of be thinking, well, I don't know, there's a sense in which this is, that Bach is, is kind of overstating the problem here. Um, or you might be thinking uh, that there's a sense in which he's understating the problem. Um, so he seems to be, overstating the problem in the sense that you wouldn't really need a distinct identity belief for every two inferentially integrated beliefs because um, identity is transitive and so all you'd actually need is a situation a bit like this right to string together all the beliefs now whether that's psychologically plausible or not is another is a question um, but I don't think we've been given any any no, nobody said anything about why it would be or wouldn't without adding some more assumptions. Okay. Um, more importantly, though, there's a sense in which he's understating the problem because the problem isn't um, really a problem about psychological plausibility. It's about something more fundamental. 
So imagine that we've got a series of identity beliefs like, like this that string together all of someone's beliefs about Dick Holloway. The issue is that this doesn't actually solve the problem of inferential integration. Okay, so here's a representation of an inference that employs as premises two substantive beliefs, I'll call them about Dick Holloway, and then an identity belief that states that the object of the first belief is identical to the object of the second belief. So that's what that, that says. Um, the issue is that that inference is, it only works if the thinker's in a position to assume that D in the first belief is the same object as D in the third belief, okay? So we could add a, we could solve that problem by adding a, another premise that says that, premise one, premise three, okay? But of course it just comes up, the problem just comes up again. Um, and so we've got um, a regress, okay? Um, so you might think the, the real problem here, the real point here is that for beliefs to be inferentially integrated, it needs to be the case that belief in identity is in some way at some point represented, encoded, I should say, without being explicitly represented. And so what Bach's saying is, you know, that that's what happens um, and that happens by the beliefs being contained in the same, in the same file. Okay, so at Strawson and Bach, I think Strawson and Bach are basically using the notion of a file in the same way. Okay, so they both use files to picture the way that minds encode without explicitly representing sameness and difference across different, of object across different thoughts. Okay, so picturesquely, mental files are clusters of information, which from the agent's perspective, apply to a single thing. Okay, and information being co-filed um, encodes without explicitly representing that the relevant mental states are about the same thing. Okay, so here's just, I mean, one other way to put this, is that on this kind of view, what co-filing does is it allows um, identity beliefs to be presupposed or to be sort of backgrounded, right? So any time what your beliefs about identity are is up for revision, but also at any time they, they sort of, they get backgrounded. So you can just, you can just go about the business of, of thinking and inferring and acting and constructing narratives and, and all the stuff that we do as, as thinkers. Okay. So philosophers are going to sometimes put that by saying that a theoretical role for files is that of, of solving a certain version of Frank's puzzle. Okay, so, so far with our early file theorists, uh, the focus has been on mental reference in the broad sense. So that just means thoughts about particular things. Okay, more recently though, the file theory has been developed into what sometimes gets called the mental files theory of singular thought. And people often present that as if it's a cashing out of the sort of file picture as we've known it since the 70s. In my view, that's not quite right. Um, and I think instead that sort of a couple of things have changed and a couple of things have gone wrong. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, so to do that, to, to, to illustrate that, I need to just say something brief and introductory about the notion of singular thought and tell you how it's related to the file picture. Okay, so basic idea of singular thought, singular thoughts are thoughts about particular things, but they're non-descriptive thoughts about particular things. So here's a way of thinking about that. Um, one way that you can think about a particular thing in the world is sort of by using what you can think of as your generalizing or categorizing abilities, right? So you can um, think about a bunch of properties, you know, property of being red, property of being round, property of being a bird, property of being in the garden, whatever. Um, and then you can compose a descriptive condition or think of it as a property condition. And then, you know, so maybe you construct the property condition of the, the red bird that's in the garden. 
And now if there's a unique particular thing that satisfies that, that property condition, then you've thought about it. Um, if there isn't, then you're sort of out of luck. So descriptivists think that thought about particular things, all of it works that way, right? They have what you could sort of picture as a properties first view of thought about particular things. And then singularists, on the other hand, think that there's another case. They think that um, sometimes we think about particular things um, without thinking of them by description. We can think of them non-descriptively, not by way of property classification. And those thoughts are called singular thoughts about particular things. Okay, so why would you think there are singular thoughts? Um, 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 many reasons, um, uh, but um, here's just one, one reason that, um, that people have found particularly compelling and sort of played an important role. Um, so just think about the fact that sometimes we manage to think about a particular thing despite the fact that we're you know, radically wrong about the kinds of properties that it has. Um, or we manage to think about a thing despite the fact that we don't have in our possession a property, a description that singles it out uniquely. Whatever information we have just undetermine what the thought is about. So for example, right, I could think that George Eliot um, wrote Jane Eyre, but I'm still thinking about George Eliot. Or I could just think, it could be that the only thoughts I have about George Eliot is that she's a famous Victorian writer and that, you know, it isn't enough to distinguish, you know, to single her out as opposed to any other famous Victorian writer. Um, okay, so um, the idea is that, you know, it seems like for that, that kind of reason, um, thinking about particular things isn't, doesn't always go by way of property classification. Um, there are also non-descriptive thoughts or non-descriptive ways of thinking about particular things. And that's an important part of how we interact with the world, how we learn about the world um, and so forth. All right, so with that in mind, um, here are some quotes from Francois Recanati, um, who is just by far the most influential, well-known um, recent file theorist. So, and he's writing in 2012 and then 2016. Okay, so Recanati says, a non-descriptive mode of presentation, so think of that just as a way of thinking about a thing, I claim is nothing but a mental file. Mental files are based on what Lewis calls acquaintance relations, so acquaintance relation is a term in philosophy that has lots of baggage and can be used in different ways. But what he means here is something like a relation by which you kind of get information from the thing. So perception, maybe testimony, that kind of relation to a thing. Okay, according to the account I develop, different types of file correspond to different types of relation. The role of files is to store information about the objects we bear these relations to. So mental files are about objects, like singular terms in language, they refer or are supposed to refer. They are indeed the mental counterparts of non-descriptive singular terms. What they refer to isn't determined by the properties which the subject takes the reference to have, i.e. by information or misinformation in the file, but through the relation on which the files are based. The reference is the entity we're acquainted with, not the entity that best fits the information file. Next, he says, you have to realize that there are two options for ways of thinking on modes of presentation. They may be descriptive, in which case the object of thought, the object is thought of as the possessor of a certain um, identifying property, but there are also non-descriptive modes of presentation. And these I claim are mental files. And then I'm gonna read one more. Um, mental files, are cognitive structures which store information about entities. They're entries in the mental encyclopedia, that is concepts. Some, following Grice, construe them as collections of information, but I prefer to think of them as akin to containers, concrete cognitive particulars, as Crimmins and Perry say. The identity of a container is independent of that of its contents. Okay. So what's going on here 
um, a couple of things, one I'll talk about in a second, but um, the first is that the file picture, so the same kind of picture that we saw Strawson and Bach were using to explain informativity of identity and um, inferential integration of, of beliefs and thoughts is being used here to distinguish singular thoughts about particular things from descriptive thoughts about particular things. So files are sort of one way to think about, they're being given an additional role, the role of distinguishing non-descriptive thoughts from descriptive thoughts. Okay, why, you know, what's, um, what's driving this? Um, again, there's, there's more than I have time to talk about, but one part of what's driving it is, is articulated by Reconati. So notice that um, he's being explicit, very explicit that the file picture posits the existence of concrete mental particulars that are independent of their contents. And then he adds to that idea that what this container-like mental particular is about isn't determined by the information that's in it, but rather by the relation to the object by which the information's gained. So, you know, file might be based on perception and um, it's that perceptual relation rather than the information that it supplies that then gets put in the file that determines, that fixes the file to the object that it's about. Okay, now think back to our motivations for singularism from a second ago. And it looks like the file picture fits nicely with the singularist view, right? That the descriptive information stored in my file on an object might be false of the object, um, right? So I might store wrote Jane Eyre in my George Eliot file. Um, it might underdetermine which object the file's about. It might be that the only information in my George Eliot file is a Victorian writer. Um, similarly, it might be that if I do have um, author of Middlemarch, that I discard that at some point. And, and that, getting rid of that information is consistent with just keeping hold of the, the file and the thought about, about George Eliot. So what that shows is that the file isn't about its object in virtue of that object, just satisfying what all of the descriptive information that's in the file. And it can sort of look like it shows that file-based thoughts are therefore singular thoughts. Okay. All right. Um, second motivation comes from Forbes, who's writing a little bit earlier. I'm wondering how I'm doing for time. Maybe I'll skip Forbes. How am I doing for time? When did I start? I should finish by the end of the, okay, I'm going to skip. I'm going to skip Forbes. Ask me about Forbes if you want to. Okay. Um, okay. So um, next I want to um, give you a sense of my perspective on this. So you've heard now a little bit about, um, about uh, the mental files theory of singular thought. Okay. Um, as a way into this, actually, I'm not going to preempt myself like that. Um, okay. So as a way into, into this, firstly, um, I'll just say something about what can look like two quite serious problems for the file theory. Okay, so first problem is this. So recall that concepts of particular things and mental files on this view that contain predicative information that the thinker takes to apply to the files referent. So that implies something that file theorists do in fact think, which is that believing that an object has a certain property is just storing a predicate in a file. Okay, but on the other hand, there's a tradition, and it's, I think it's natural enough, of thinking that concepts, object concepts, are constituents or building blocks of thought, right? So the thought that Marianne Evans died many years ago or was an author um, is composed out of, it's built out of my, my concept of Marianne Evans and my concept of being an author. They get put together to, to make the thought. So the worry is that, um, you know, you, it can look like the file theorist is either getting things the wrong way around or they're positing a, a kind of mutual containment that doesn't make any sense. It's a kind of puzzle. So that's the first problem. Second problem is files are meant to be containers. 
they're meant to be cog, co um, concrete cognitive particulars that persist through information change, information changing that's in them. If they're concrete cognitive particulars, persisting concrete cognitive particulars, then the question of their identity conditions over time comes up. And that's given rise to just a lot of debates about the right kind of way to individuate files, right? Recanati and others following him say that each file is based on a particular type of acquaintance relation or information relation. And that sort of suggests a view that the file lasts only as long as, say, the perceptual connection to an object lasts. Um, but, you know, sometimes it, it seems like um, I can have inferentially integrated a belief that I formed on Monday on the basis of perception and a belief that I formed on Tuesday on the basis of testimony. And so then the question is, what should we, how should we think about that? Is, is it that there's another very coarse grained file or is it that there's some kind of operation where information gets taken out of one, put into another and so forth? People are worried about a lot about that. Okay. so. Um, it, to be clear, it's not that these problems couldn't be solved, um, but they are tricky questions. A lot of sort of ink has been spilled on them. And actually, I sort of think that the right reaction to those problems is to just sort of step back and think about what the best version of the mental file theory of reference is. And to do that, I think it helps to point um, to, to look back to something I pointed out at the beginning of the talk, and that is that the theory involves this use of a metaphor. And with any metaphor, um, especially one that's being used as part of a theory, there's always a question of how seriously to take it and what the relevant comparison is. Okay, so with that in mind, um, here's a quote from a paper by Goodman and Gray from 2022. Um, I am and my um, esteemed colleague over there, um, Aidan, is the grey. Um, okay, so um, the mental files framework has been a persistent presence in philosophy of mind and language for the last half century and has enjoyed increased popularity in recent years. It has not gone unnoticed, however, that apparent metaphors of files of information being contained in files, etc., play a central role in explications of the view. But it's been unclear how seriously we ought to take these metaphors. We aim to characterize the basic commitments of the approach in non metaphorical terms. The guiding question is once we move beyond the metaphors, um, whether there's any theoretical role for files as mental particulars. And our suggestion is there is not. To put our view in a slogan, so called mental file theory is committed to mental filing, but not to mental files. Okay, so what we suggest in, in the paper is that the best way to understand the file theory is that when you go to cash out the theory, you should be, a, be beware of taking certain parts of the metaphor too seriously. Um, so remember the quote from Recanati where he's claiming that files are concrete cognitive particulars. Um, for Goodman and Gray, that's just not the best way to think about the file theory. So the best version of the theory says instead that um, minds are filing systems in the sense that they employ what we call filing processes in order to determine how information's arranged and related. Um, but they don't operate with mental particulars that have file structure. Okay, so basically, we think the version of the theory that kind of reveals its essential commitments says two things. Firstly, at any given time, there are encoded co-reference relations. I think of them as inferential integration relations, looking back at, at Bach. Okay. And those relations stand between the mental representations that instantiate thoughts and beliefs. If you want, you can think of those relations as clustering facts. You can sort of think of them in that sort of picturesque way, but don't be misled by that metaphor into positing particular things with file-like or container-like structure. Um, so the, the second thing is that at any 
time, you know, these, these relations exist, but they exist in virtue, we think, of a certain kind of process. Essentially, that's just a process of sort of keeping track of things, um, reliably sorting information that gets encountered at different times and from different perspectives, such that the information then is encoded as either concerning a single thing or concerning or not concerning the same thing. Um, we, we sort of call them mental filing processes, but in a way you might think they're more appropriately called sorting processes because they're not meant to be processes that feed information into a file. Okay, so we think those processes are really crucial to how a filing, mental filing system works, but, um, but mental files, mental particulars with file structure are not. Okay, all right, so listen, um, notice that all the kind of containment puzzles and the individuation puzzles just don't come up on this view. Um, the reason they don't come up is because we think it's inessential to the view, we think it's inessential to the picture of the mind as operating like a filing system, that there are mental particulars that contain information and that they persist, you know, only as long as certain kinds of information relations. Okay, so what we've sort of done is given, we haven't argued for the view, it might not be right, but we've given a kind of version of it that rids it of some of the commitments that people have found most problematic about it. Okay, so I, I want to mention two things. The first is I just want to sort of point out, I want to emphasize that I, I hope that I haven't, and I haven't meant to sort of um, suggest that Reconati um, thinks that um, there are literal containers in our heads. Um, that is not what he thinks. Um, the issue is um, whether the file theory posits cognitive mental particulars, concrete mental particulars with functional file structure. So you can ask me more about that if you want to. Okay, but the point that I really want to make um, is something that isn't discussed in Goodman and Gray. Um, and that's that I sort of think that this mental filing without files view is actually consistent with the way that the early file theorists use the metaphor. Um, and it's only with the recent theorists that insistence on files as mental particulars with containment structure, so it's only then that that sort of comes up. And so to give just a little bit of proof of that, I want to give you another quote from Strawson. Um, uh, and so this is meant to be, uh, this is meant to sort of justify the idea that this idea, the mental filing view, isn't a kind of distortion of the original picture, but actually a, a sort of picture that goes nicely with some of the early theorists. Um, so when Strawson gives the metaphor of files that you saw earlier, he actually gives it as one of two possible metaphors that are meant to illustrate the same idea or the same point. So here's the other one. Um, so he says, I offer then a model or a picture of a man's knowledge of or belief about all those particular items of which he has some knowledge. We are to picture a map, as it were, of his knowledge in an extended sense of these words. On the knowledge map, we represent the unity of every cluster of identifying knowledge, identifying knowledge which the man regards as identifying knowledge of one and the same particular item by a filled in circle or dot, such as is used um, to represent stations on railway maps. Any name he knows, which for him in suitable circumstances invokes that cluster of identifying knowledge is written adjacent to the dot. And from each dot radiate lines bearing one or more place predicate expressions. And these lines with their inscriptions represent the various propositions which the man is able to affirm from his own knowledge regarding items which the appropriate cluster of identifying knowledge is knowledge of. These are lines of different kinds. Some join one dot to another. These are relational propositions like Caesar loves Brutus. Some curl back on their dot of origin. They're reflexively um, relational propositions like Caesar loves himself. Some are joined to a dot at only one end. These are the non-relational propositions like Caesar was bald. Okay, so notice there's no containment talk here, um, or file talk. And in fact, the picture is more of a kind of map picture or sort of graph-like picture than a file picture. Okay, so what we've got is um, individual 
object representations and then representation of um, predication and of relational belief is done by these kind of lines or kind of directed edges. Um, so on this kind of picture, the fact that two beliefs that are co-referential, say the belief that Caesar was bored and the belief that Caesar loved Brutus, um, the fact that those beliefs uh, encode their co-reference, the fact that they're presumed to be about the same thing by the thinker, that's encoded by the fact that the same object representation is being used, the same vertex is being used in both. So the point I just want to emphasize is that Strawson thinks this metaphor um, illustrates the, the same facts as the file card metaphor. Um, so I take it that mental particulars with containment structure isn't really important to him. He's happy to go with either view. Um, okay. Um, so my suggestion is that early file theorists kind of use the metaphor of files to explain integration of beliefs in a way that doesn't really rely on talk of files as mental particulars. Um, it's only with uh, Reconati um, and um, with him sort of trying to cash out the metaphor um, that we get this kind of fixation on a part of the metaphor that isn't bearing theoretical weight and is kind of causing problems and puzzles. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I was going to talk about one more thing, but I kind of think maybe I should, I think maybe it's a good time to finish. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to finish. You guys look sleepy. All right. Um, okay. Thank you. Should I? I'm happy to start things off. Um, thank you so much for this talk and how um, it's so beautifully pitched for a, a variety of listeners here. Um, and I was wondering if I could ask you a sort of literary question. Yeah. Because of your English background, for sure. Um, <laughs> but because you did, you, know, you used, you know, obviously the metaphor issue. Yeah. Um, which sometimes actually seems like the problem is that it's a metaphor, but that it literalizes the metaphor. Like it, yeah. you know, like it, that they don't take it metaphorically enough, right? Yeah. So, I mean, that's mm -hmm. really but that's not what my question is. It's, it's more about um, the interesting way in which these examples are about characters and about subjects, about narration. Yeah. And you mentioned the word narrative and how we would like to narrate. Um, through time, yeah, and that that's one of the advantages mm -hmm. of the, these notions because yeah. you know once we get that in our heads, it's easier to say that um, one thing happens at one moment and one thing happens at the next moment, and that it's the same same thing. individual. And yeah. So I'm wondering how much is generated by that sense of need to tell narratives and how much is generated by our you know it's it's interesting that the examples are about people um and that you know our our own you know um uh western intellectual tradition is kind of built around certain conceptions about the urgency of subjectivity and that subjectivity being located in time and the desire to um, say that the person tomorrow is the person today. Uh -huh. um, like how much, I mean, is it your sense um, looking at this literature mm -hmm. that those needs, those um, not just metaphysical needs, but one might call them formal needs that we have certain ways of narrating experience that that really drive us to be able to make those claims about subjects and make those claims about um, narrated and narratable subjects. Um, how much does that influence this big course? Yeah, so let me, maybe, maybe I'll say a couple of things and tell me if this speaks to the sort of things that you're, you're interested in. I mean, I think that, um, 
I do think that it's a really um it's a really basic ordinary um sort of fundamental fact about the the way that we sort of think about the world or encounter the world or experience the world that it's got individuals in it and um I also think that it, you know um it's also part of you know really basic fact about how we kind of negotiate the world that we care, you know, we care whether it's the same one or a different one because we take them to be individual, we take them to be things that persist over time. That's kind of part of, call it our conceptual scheme. Um, and so I do think there's a sense in which that's driving, you know, part of, yeah, I mean, at a certain level, that's driving the fact that we want a kind of picture of thought, right? And our thinking abilities and what we do when we think about the world that sort of matches up with that, that says that these are thoughts that are about that are about what seem to us to be assisting individuals that we encounter at different times from different perspectives. It can be the same one again. We care about them. So we want to know, you know, is this information about the one, the thing that I, you know, have some interest in? Um, does that speak a little bit to what you're it sort does. of interested in? In. And, and I guess I wonder, like, to what extent is that worthy of just wondering about questioning? Because one, you know, the certain, yeah. certain ways of thinking, you know, like one thinks about, um, you know, certain kinds of conversion narratives and kind of insisting upon that non-identity that, you know, you are the same person yeah. that you were, um, you know, a year ago, even <laughs> yesterday, because you're converted, or yeah. you know, in certain discourses of punishment, that <laughs> you're not the person that you murdered, that 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 murdered someone. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, is your sort of thought, if you're kind of worried about that, if you think that, does this kind of insistence that you want to keep track of all the individuals and their identity, does that allow for that, or something, or something does like it allow that? For it and uh, like, what scope is there? Um, in a project like this, or wondering, like, yeah, why do we care about the identity of Caesar, or why do? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think so. Two, so I mean, two things. So, one, I think, um, I think there is still scope to answer those questions because, so, like, without getting sort of into the weeds, I guess, I think that you can think that there are persisting things. Um, think that there are lots of different kinds of persisting things and that there's all different ways that they persist and kind of conditions for their persistence. So it may be that right on a certain view, let's say you're not the same person you were, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and so now, you know, one, if that's the case, if that, then that, and if, if someone, if, you know, if that's my view, then I've got to keep track of that. Yeah. Um, and then on the question of whether there's space to sort of ask the question about, I mean, about significance. Um, I mean, I'll just mention that there are people who, I don't actually, I don't haven't sort of necessarily agreed with this view, but there are people who have sort of um, tried to kind of ask the question, like under what conditions do you open a file? Um, and have have tried to sort of say something like, you know, you do that when an object has some significance to you. Um, so actually, I'm gonna, if it's okay, I'm gonna bring up this. This is a Forbes quote that I skipped, right? So, um, so he he says, suppose to adapt Russell's example that as a result of regaining your confidence in the integrity of electoral processes in Louisiana, you come to believe that the official winner of the next election will in fact be the candidate who gets the most votes. And he says, this doesn't mean that you've got a dossier labeled official winner of the next election. Um, there's no specific individual of whom you are thinking when you use that description. Um, and this is something that you're quite aware of. Um, you don't take yourself to be in the business of keeping track of anything. All you care about in this case is that the object who happens to have the property of being the official winner of the election is going to also have the property of, of having gotten the most votes. Um, and so there is a kind of view out there 
that there are kind of two different cases um, of thinking about an object by description, yeah. right? One is where you just go on now and like research electoral processes. And another one is where you open a file and, you, and, that, and that happens when you've got some interest in an individual. So yeah, I mean, I think if I'm understanding the kind of set of concerns, I think like you might think something like, I mean, speaking really loosely, you might think something like, a, a person could think something like, you know, when do you, under what conditions do you, have, do you keep a file? It's like you don't have a dossier on someone where you don't need any information about them or don't care or don't, um, don't anticipate encountering them again, right? Yeah, um, right? That would be a strange, that would not be a good filing system. That would just be a wasteful filing system. Yeah, um, yeah. So I think there's some space for that kind of, right. that kind of thought. Yeah. That yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. Daniel and then So thank you for very good talk. There was one thing that I wasn't quite sure on. And I yeah. Asked the question by setting up what I think my understanding is. Yeah. So we have this metal file view that's developed for me. Mm -hmm. so Conti picks it up, mm -hmm. it specifically uses it to cache out the distinction between singular files and descriptive files. Mm -hmm. And to do that, he really leans heavily on the idea of a, a file that's and then is it your view that then that leads to all these other problems about identity and so forth? So we can jettison that part of this and go back to a neo Strassian or something, a, a simpler view of files yeah. and, and not carry all that baggage in it. So it's just is it just the container stuff that's going to. Yeah. Is causing the problem with the mental file view, and then if you get rid of that, it's all smooth sailing. No, yeah, it's good. Um, sorry, I haven't really finished. Yet. So, uh, yeah, so for example, that last uh, graphic with the straws and the dots and the Yeah. I thought, yeah. well, aren't it's the same kind of identity worries that come up here? It's, it's going to come up maybe in a different way. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I just wasn't seeing. Yeah, so so good. So let's yeah, so no, I don't think it's all smooth sailing. Um what do I think? I think that um that the particular the um particular versions of the worry that people that people have are not gonna come up. Um I think the containment worry won't come up. That um, won't no. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Right. Um and I think that also I'm trying to think of the best way to answer this. So Okay, so again, I don't think that there's no way a, a, a recognition style file theorist could give a good account of in the dichotomy in situation. I don't think anything like that. But I do think that um, the kind of, that the part of the picture um, that suggests that you have a file for each relation, for each um, sequential relation. Um, uh, um, causes problems, um, and that we can get rid of here. Um, it's not particularly to do with the structure, but we don't. I mean, what what I mean, what this picture suggests is that every thought that's inferentially coordinated now, yeah. um, with these ones. It's gonna. Sorry, that was an overstatement. Every thought that's inferentially coordinated, in the sense that it's about Caesar and Jurgen, that's evident to you, um, is gonna employ the same object representation. Now, um, it hasn't made actually any claims about um, persistence of this object representation over time. Um, you know that it hasn't. It's what it said is that the way that the way that that information comes. So on the, there's different versions of, of such a, of this view, the Strasser view, but on the hood and gray view, it said that you came upon current state or kind of um, information integration by way of a reliable sort of process. Um, not that it's a process of a particular kind. Does that, does that help slightly? But also, no, but then just to say another thing, no, I don't think like this is really simple. 
um, and straightforward. Um, I think, I mean, so on the singular thought stuff, what I think is um, that, um, well, actually, I won't talk about that. What I'll just say is, no, there's lots of things that need to be worked out about whether this could be an overall picture of how the encoding of co-reference works, because it hasn't said anything about, you know, um, different kinds of thought, you know, right. all that, you know, that, that would have to be um, um, yeah, so no, I don't think it's necessarily um, what I think is that the idea of a, um, a mental particular with functional containment structure is problematic. Not just because, I mean, so, so can I say one more thing about this as well, which is that not just because of the sort of containment puzzle, the mental containment puzzle, um, but um, because it, it's, I mean, like, if you go back to, if we come back to, um, like, this, this picture, right, um, if you've got this sort of containment picture, then, I mean, this might be true, but what is it to have the relational information or it's for it to be encoded twice and then there's to be a sort of cross-referencing and so presumably there might be, that could be the facts and maybe you try and test them right like you'd find out whether you could lose this belief and keep that one um you know it might be something that happens or not something that happens if it were something that happens for example then that would give us a reason to have this kind of picture but part of what's the sort of containment thing is sort of in a way it's it's becoming it's 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 making it's making a kind of commitment and therefore potentially um, um, it's late in the day. I'm struggling for words. Um, bringing up problems is what I was going to say that you wouldn't otherwise have to um, deal with, like yeah. this one. Yeah, so it really is the containment part of it. So at one point you you know, yeah. characterized it you was know, Yeah. And then it's an essential file link and add the developmental file. Yeah. But really, I mean, you can have a mental file that amounts to just a file. Sure, then it's not a file. Then it's not a file. As long as it doesn't, you can't open it for two. Yeah, so what it is, it's like it's about whether there's a particular containment structure, functional containment structure, or part of it. Does that, did I ask you a question? Yeah. It took me a long time to get that. I mean, it's all following up on this yeah um so i mean that's helped to probably make things like more more precise but i mean um what i might have thought that the move from uh files to just filing without a file i mean that was sort of bringing up the significance of the containment aspect of it but you might have thought that the or might have thought that the problem with the files picture was it's a long necessary verification or something, right? And so the, what it looks in the move that you offer us is it's the verification of kind of activity into a sort of standing like uh container of the information. Uh, but I mean from uh at least many points of view, I mean I think lots lot of philosophers of mine will say that like any process of filing actual process of filing would, would be a, a concrete particular. I mean, a, a, you know, a, a concrete particular that is a temporal particular, I mean, whether it was an event or a process or something, right? I mean, oh, sure. Um, well, I suppose I sort of wonder like, why why we even need the process. And it, like, so we didn't need the, I mean, no suggestion was we don't need the container. We can make do with these processes. Look, but why do you need a process? Like, we, why do you not just want to have the ability to make the relevant? I'll tell you. Um uh so um uh so this so here's a view. Um um this um and then then we could sort of um you know um so um so just to what do I want? I want an inference. Um, so the, the thought is 
you know, I find myself, actually, actually, I'm going to give a slightly different example. So say that, um, you know, I'm watching a ball roll down the down hill. Um, and I kind of form the ball, you know, back there. And then I form the ball back down. And then I find myself in a position, you know, um, imagine this is going on in time. Um, I find myself in a position to think there's a single thing that's red around, you know, it's a red round thing. Um, so a thought that a claim that I've defended in a separate paper and also is, is defended in the grey paper is that, you know, listen, you, what makes it the case at the time that you, that it would be, um, that your inferences are likely to be good ones, and therefore that you're, you know, rational and just sort of taking the grounds of this thing, this thing, is the fact that there's been a process of watching, we can track of the thing. And that process is reliable, and it's a process whereby, you know, it's only information from that thing that I take to be relevant to that thing. Um, you know, that's what seems to kind of undergird, put me in a situation. I mean, so another way of putting it is imagine that I am a creature who just encodes information as, um, as co-referential without, you know, representing it, just randomly. You know, information pops up in different ways at different times, and um, and I find a way in some way or other. Um, the intuition is that 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 creature is really different to me and different to me, and that creature wouldn't be a creature who could really make rational inferences in a sort of different sense. Um, they wouldn't be entitled because they hadn't been keeping track of things when they got to a sort of time where they had a bunch of information. They wouldn't be entitled to make the assumptions that they are in a position to sort of rationally make um, that this information, you know, comes from the same objects that information. So that's the thought behind why we need a process. Yeah, I mean, in sort of a particular case where the, so to speak, where it seems like we can identify a process, this, this one for keeping track of the boulder visually to go down the hill. Um, well, we can in, we can identify for this process of the of watching a ball go down here you know, independently of identifying independently of regarding it as a as a process of filing the filing process. Uh, mm -hmm. But it seems to me that there will be other lots of other cases where we want to say, or I mean, where I assume you will want to say there is filing going on for it, like over a period of years. Yeah. Um, but there'll be like no reason to think that there is an ongoing process of filing going on, except for the fact that you think that the person is entitled to make the relevant kind of reference for No, I don't think I, I disagree with that. So I, I think that we do have a reason to think that if I am in a position of some time to make relevant, you know, this is the trailer and this is the reference then, you know, there has been a process. I mean, you can think of it as going, I mean, I think you're actually, I think it's totally right that sometimes they just go on over the years, right? Like I've had a file on you for a lot of time. Um, and, um, you know, I've been adding it, tracking information, and, you know, and I do think that there's kind of, in, in the sense that, that I'm in it, I think there has been a process. Um, now, something that maybe is, um, I don't know, like maybe it's making us talk slightly, I don't know, maybe it's talking slightly across purposes, is that, um, it, I mean, the reference argument is actually more sophisticated than the following, much more sophisticated, but a kind of version of that is it has to be a perceptual process, a testimonial process. Um, and, it's, you know, of course, like I've received you, heard about you, you know, encountered you in all sorts of different ways. And so well, um, we don't think um, that, the, the, the kind of, um, it's not, I mean, and that's very familiar from the kind of Freudian picture, right? And the way that the Freudians, especially uh, kind of neo Freudians, try and go away, go about thinking about modes of presentation. But the confession based one, and there's the testimony based ones, and there's the, and the lexical ones. Um, and there's something kind of uh, substantive about the nature of that kind of process that means this is the perceptive. 
Um, and anything that comes in from a different perspective is going to be a different interpretation. And so the, the view that that the fifth is is you know no that's not part of it. Um, in a broader sense, you think we can track and that's all that's meant by those us. Yeah, Did all keep? Well, so my, my question is uh, when it works for the literary nature, so that's the word you could uh, uh, <laughs> not fall within the scope of your front there. Um, but in, in your quote, uh, I couldn't be great, um, you, you have a line about kind of moving beyond the metaphor. Yeah, could I? Yeah, could. Yeah. Um, but yeah. like, I, you know, for like, some of it, that's what you mean, but it, it would strike me that we're not going to move. Beyond the metaphor, so this can move on to another metaphor. Um, so it, it's about, you know, what kind of work uh, the file metaphor is doing, yeah. the materiality of that. Yeah. You know, I'm kind of, you know, thinking, I, and I think, even, you know, from Plato to August, you know, maybe even well into you know, the months, the mind and memory are described as like a wax tablet, right? So that's, for a while, right? Maybe that it still speaks to something for us today. Um, but you know, kind of using a metaphor that is historically specific. I mean, I guess maybe there are two ways I'm wondering about it. One would be like, you know, does it make sense to talk about mental files or even mental filing for a mind, you know, for or in a culture without, you know, mm -hmm. filing cabinets. Um, but then, you know, also maybe a kind of question of the representation of mental representation. You know, I mean, how important it is or how useful it is that the metaphor is part of our lived experience. You know, I mean, I, I wonder, you know, about the, the afterlife of like an article written in the, the 90s that talked about like, Mental yeah. floppy disks, or even to be wrong, I feel you know, like you it's sort of yeah. floppy, like it's yeah, yeah it's sexually <laughs> close to the minds, like they sort of claim that we could be a machine for do yeah, yeah. It's like me. So, um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, so I interrupted you. No, no, I, I mean, I was pretty much done, but just like you know, not that a floppy disk doesn't communicate anything useful and isn't so different from a file, mm -hmm. um, but it would just seem like a silly metaphor to think through because it's so outdated. Well, I don't know, maybe not. Yeah. Maybe for both laugh, right? And not part of our lived experience anymore. Yeah. So it seems no, I mean, not useful. So, right, so let me yeah. say something about it and tell me if it speaks sure. to what you're sort of... I mean, there are a few things, but, um, you know, so one question is, you know, so if I'm going to go about giving the kind of... I mean, you, I mean doing anything with a metaphor, um, you know, giving it using it as kind of theory or using it in terms of many other probably more interesting ways than metaphor is. Um, um, you know, it needs to be a metaphor that I mean, what does a metaphor do? That's a question. But one thing it might do is get you to sort of picture one kind of thing to another kind of thing and sort of think about what your conception of that kind of thing is and and, and sort of reflect on, you know, transfer some of that. Um, see in this thing that which you would find that thing, and that only works if. You know, the thing has some, you, you know, your audience can, can kind of get a whole of the relevant bits of the metaphor. That seems right to me, and that seems like a reason why sometimes when, I mean, just in philosophy, right, sometimes you do look at these kind of, you know, something written 25, 30 years ago, and I picked things written a little while ago, but some, some of those things you put them, you don't, it's hard to imagine them because you don't, you don't, the metaphor doesn't mean much to you. Um, so I think that that's true. Um, um, I think that you were also sort of asking about, does that fit somewhat to, I mean, I've just said yes, that seems right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so then what's the, I, yeah, we'll continue, but I guess maybe then my question is, you know, what is, then the, does your use of does this metaphor mm -hmm. have a sort of shelf life? Um, yeah, probably. Um, I mean, in that sense, yeah. Um, I mean, so the other thing that I was going to just say something about that you mentioned earlier in your question is that it sort of seemed as if this talks about moving beyond the metaphors. Um, and then, <laughs> and then I get, and then I said, here's another metaphor, um, from Strawson and gave you, and that's absolutely 
right. Um, so, um, so, I mean, here's what's actually happening is in this paper, we try and say, we try and do something that we call hashing out here. Um, which, you know, it's saying like, what, what is this metaphor? Like, people are using it, but what is it that it, it, it's, what commitments is it helping us to kind of picture? Um, and we sort of say, well, it's this aspect of the comparison, aspect that there's a process of a certain kind, not the aspect that there's a container. Um, uh, and so I don't, I mean, this, you know, I saw some of the language I used was like, oh, people are taking the metaphor too literally. And one, one reaction to that is we ought to just leave it as a metaphor. Um, and I think there are lots of times that we ought to leave metaphors as metaphors. I mean, one of the nice things about metaphors is that they are open-ended. I guess I get, and I guess this is part of the question for philosophy. So I'm that when you use a metaphor in a theory in this kind of way, it feels to me like it is appropriate. You're using it to illustrate something that is sort of appropriate to um, say, let's not make this open ended. Let's let's sort of talk about what commitments we're trying to um, we're trying to um, we're trying to kind of stay with it. So in a way, I think that's an, you know super use of metaphors. And you're right, Strawson does the metaphor. I'm saying this way of talking was better than that. Okay. Oh, sorry, I think I actually pitched. You're planning. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is, I can't remember whether this case is trivial or not, but it's just really because it's negative and I don't know if I'm also sure. So the, the question is, what did we learn and how does this demonstrate to help us with the case where we learn what I would think of as like a disidentification about? Mm -hmm. Right? So I realized that I've got to be two files together and I now think that they represent two different and it's not just that there's no fact it's the wrong product. Yes. So and the anecdote is this I was I think I was okay. Well I know in Albanian she was spoon to meet her about her grandmother and she in order to like learn about her grandmother she got the state files about her grandmother which is spy on for her it's complicated in mm -hmm. Albanian politics. And it, in the course of going through these files where she was going to finally learn facts about her grandmother she came to realize the spy who had been filling the file, mm -hmm. literally the file, mm -hmm. like, on her grandmother was reporting on two different people mm -hmm. and putting them into the same file. So now she had, she came to realize that not everything in the file was about her grandmother, but she didn't know why. Exactly. That's what I was and saying. And the final thing is when the state found this out, yeah. what they did yeah. was they executed the spy. Mm -hmm. We're not committed to this being one person. We're not going to make it the case that this is one person by getting rid of the evidence that we're talking about. That's troubling. Many things that I'll talk about. I mean, what I was going to say is, right, that kind of case, like, it does say something that's kind of case. I, I really am interested in that case. Uh -huh. um, I tried to sort of like <laughs> several years ago, I tried to sort of write a paper that said something about this kind of case because, right, so what, what, what you're pointing out is okay, so there's a natural thing that it looks like, as you just said, which is you know, there's a the, the, the vision, not vision, you know, so you just you, you take you have one and you create a two, but then of course, that case is a much harder case because. There is um, a question about how what you do with the information. Um, and so um, I think that there are cases and cases. Um, so I was sort of at one point just in interested in cases of like cross modal, the basic cases. Um, you know, the, the find out, right, the thing that I've been touching is not the thing that I've been looking at. Um, and um, I think there's an empirical, there's just an empirical question about what you're in a position to do at that point in different kinds of cases. It would be interesting if you were in a position to to reorganize reliability, because you would think that that would suggest that there's some sort of structure. If, if the file picture is the right picture, you know, there's some sort of structure initially mm -hmm. that's kind of encoded such that then it's sort of relatively straightforward. Maybe in some sort of really short cases, you need to remember that. You know, only that was information Tony told me, and that was information they told me. But in lots of cases, you don't have any position to do that. And so it looks like getting out of the confusion is, I mean, I don't know if the rational thing to do is to be like, 
you know, you know, only information in the file. So I don't know. I feel, I suspect there's not like one answer to how those cases work. I suspect it depends um, on the cases, but that thinking about how they work would tell if if this view is something like along the right lines, then that would tell us something. What happens in those cases is tell us something about the organization, um, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, 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 let me, let me, I think this is related. Um, and I'm resisting the temptation to call it any But of course, clearly the right metaphor for memory is the magnetic case. Because <laughs> 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 you spend a lot of time waiting for them to mount, and you can only access information in a specific order. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this thing about not opening files. Uh, I'm so much trouble in my life has come out uh, of meeting people and failing to open files I know, because I thought I would never see them again. <laughs> 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 yeah, why do you sometimes? People are better and worse. Anyway, um, but the real um, question is so. If I understand your theory, you've got these filing processes going on, and the identity of the filing process plays the same role as the identity of the file in the file picture. I, I don't know. Um, it doesn't seem like it has to be. I mean, I don't. I don't think that that has to be part of the picture that we're like trying to think about. Um, so I. I think what needs to be the case is that one. I mean, so listen. Here's a here's a a view that I'm not about, um, but just you know, stating is there's just a, a process of keeping track of individuals, mm -hmm. and it operate and you know, it keeps track of you and it keeps track of people mm -hmm. and it keeps track of. Someone, someone else. Um, I think that we care about is that it's is that it's reliable, mm -hmm. and it's a kind of reliable sort of sorting process. Mm -hmm. um, so, I I don't know whether that I don't know whether that requires that we're saying you know one. Set of encoded facts per process or something, something like that. Um, okay, so, so now what I wonder is, are you, but you know, so the, the mental files idea mm -hmm. was at least supposed to tell us a little about the way in which this information was encoded, um, in, in the sense that it, it got a certain kind of association. And I thought you said it had to have this file structure. No. But after, after, not, not your view. Not your view. Oh, the other view. Oh, the other view. Right, yeah, right. Uh, yes, yes, so yes, the yes, other view yes. actually said something. Yes. Well, yes, well, exactly. Is Sorry. Your, yes. is, it your, is your view just that you're just going to refuse to address those questions? It's just reliable? Um, so all you're so, saying is that it does it? No, 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 but so listen, I don't think that, I mean, two things. So um, I don't think, no, I don't think that refusal to fix the question. <laughs> you know what call it that? That sounds bad. Um, 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 I think that, you know, we haven't been given, I mean, so to say that, that, that there are many particulars of containment structure, mm -hmm. Is not actually to address questions about. It's not actually really. That's not actually really to address questions about the nature of the process. Mm -hmm. um, um, so in that sense, if, you know there are questions about how the process works, how different cases. Right. Um, um, so I feel like the the 
the containment structure thing is taking on a commitment about the kind of architecture or something mm -hmm. that we are not taking on. Mm -hmm. You know, one other kind of sort of commitment is the graph architecture. We have a taken map from this projection can go over the file view. Um, so um yeah, I don't actually see necessarily how the traditional file picture comes out better with respect to that question than, than, than what we've said. What it's done is made a, a commitment, which I mean, and we're not, I mean, it's not that it, if you, so if I think about the sort of thing that psychologists do, like object files and stuff like that, mm -hmm. like they're in the business of sort of testing for file structure. And then you've got some evidence of this file structure. And so, I mean, one way of thinking about what we're saying is it's a kind of I mean, philosophers don't do like mental with mental files, but they don't do that. They just, you know, take that little metaphor seriously, which involves kind of making a claim about the sort of structure, which is not. Okay, so then then the idea is that the traditional view kind of makes a a claim about a certain mental structure that, according to you, doesn't actually contribute to solving the problem. And it's better to kind of retreat back and say, all we really know is yeah. that the problem gets solved. Yeah, and it gets, and yeah, it gets solved and it gets solved by some kind of reliable. And then there's like lots of, you know, questions about how this was working. Um, yeah. Well, I, I have a bunch of questions that have to do with this work and the reader and Yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, one in general has to do with the use of proper names in literary fiction. Yeah. Um, and so I, I have like several examples that, that, that so what one of the things that I'm thinking is that. Apparently, we need this fight to process reality. <laughs> um, last week, we were discussing the idea of individual identity. Yeah. Per se, right? Yes. But apparently, we, from what I, I understand, it seems like we need to grasp onto this idea of, you know, of identity yeah. Um, yeah. to make sense of it. Oh, we do, yeah. Um, like one of the examples that comes to mind right now, for example, is, is um, that I have not read the book yet, but um, I know it's been published his autobiography, or not autobiography, his biography of the wife of Bach, this character of the text. Right? So the idea of writing a biography of a fictional character. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so, so that's um but a more complicated case. Um I'm thinking of a, a novel that precisely breaks this idea of identity when you talked about it that we need the continuity of the character in the narrative. I see. And this character, so yeah. you, you have like different different uh aspects of characters that you realize might be the same person yeah. but but there are some cases in which this is possible because if they were the same person this person would be his own father or we have witness when uh oh. was received yeah. uh, by someone else yeah. or like yeah yeah. Um, yeah yeah and so we accept this in fiction, yes. but we cannot work uh, our world from doing that. So yeah. that be, I don't know what happens. No, I think it is clear. I'm just thinking, no, I'm just thinking about the, pa the papers and just thinking about, um, so that's interesting. I mean, so a bit that I sort of didn't get to um, was that, um, Okay, so I'm going to say a simple thing about a way, a way of thinking about that kind of case that seems important to me. I don't know, I'm thinking about it all. But um, so remember, I sort of said, well, this is kind of what this is kind of Revenati view that associates uh, filing with singular thought because 
you know, it's not the descriptions in the descriptions in the file don't tell you what to do with that. Um, the descriptions in the file um, don't determine the reference. Um, I think that um, so in the, the, the some of my work where I try and say that the file picture is if it's a good picture at all, it's actually just a very general kind of picture. It's not a picture of specifically one descriptive thought. So one way of thinking about your cases, I was thinking about cases where you know you, you are using and this can be common, you're using property information that you're sort of storing about the person as as part of your kind of um as part of your method for keeping track. You know, all this, you know, this information is coming from um from the same topic, you know, is that thing is read and I know it's kind of contagious as you say or whatever. <laughs> um, um and so that seems like the case where um the just I'm gonna let us talk about stored in fire. I'm just gonna talk that way in working on the second the information stored in the file is playing this what I would in, in the paper that I have for a kind of doubling role, kind of information partialing role. Um, so I actually think that that can happen, um, and that's one of those cases and related cases are reasons to think that um, the file that's taught can be restricted. Did that, did that speak to, sorry, I think that I think, I think the other thing, the other yeah. thing to take the key is um, another thing that we're sort of emphasizing is that, um, that, we, that there are, but I say quite simple thing about narratives, um, which is exactly right, um, which is to try and construct one without some sort of beliefs about, about the characters being the same. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and you're, and you're <laughs> pointing out that there are, there are all sorts of narratives out there, which are, <laughs> um, that, um, that was, you know, the, the people don't have the, the key vision of a, the, uh, I I just have a Yeah, I think I don't know if it's a matter. So oh yeah, from lots of yeah, yeah, yeah. So the identity the identity name and and character or file is is one of the things. I I I I think you can more about it. But my sense is that those I think he's right that those kinds of narratives are um that they are that. that Part of their point is they're sort of disruptive and mm -hmm. bigger than that they, you know, they make them sort of feel like they're not, you know, the world that the world that they're sort of um that they're kind of um the world they're creating is um is sort of is interestingly and strikingly unlike the world that we're just moving through. Mm -hmm. Um and so I guess I, I would think that you know partly a narrative like that mm -hmm. can be created unless did have some practice and did keep track of them to be then like both of them. Um but that's yeah that's 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 people that's 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 that's